Okay, okay, we'll see how we go. Yep. Let's print, can you print it during the session and print it and do it like at the end of the session as well? Yeah, that'd be good. Cause, yeah, okay. <coughs> Today, we'll, it's our last session on Christian worldview yeah. for the whole ever. ever. <laughs> so, um, we'll be starting evangelism next week. Wow. That's going to be amazing. Very cool. So, um, yeah, so now is the time to have a quick catch up on where we're at with assignments and everything. Um, Alan, Gloria, you've got two more weeks to do your feedback. You've done it already? We wasted it on oh. the same stage. It was just <laughs> like the day before me. I was kind of just finishing off the slides. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. And you've got it, then you've got the quiz. Yeah. This which is quiz got me kind of stuck right? in the holidays, right? I've, sent, I've scheduled it for the holidays. So that's cool. So that's really good. Um, Josh and Lauren have a devotion that's sort of due last week. And, and it, they, your bibliography, you've got a couple of weeks, a month to get your bibliography ready. Oh, it's 29th of October or something. You've got to do with it. But you really pretty much have done half of the essay by the time you sorted that out. So have you chosen the topic? That's the thing. So this week, we're going to wrap up our devotions and then you have to hit that essay hard, right? So choose your topic, do your research, make your bibliography. <clears throat> That's pretty important. And we'll have a presentation from Lauren sometime in the middle of the session. And then we'll have one at the end from Josh, if all goes according to plan. Um, what else do we need to know? Good to see you at pre-meeting last night. That was cool. Um, Josh, can you fix the camera? Because I'm like in the back. Is that a camera setting? Yep, okay, cool. That's cool. Apart from that, um, we have today we're going to do conversion and sanctification. We're going to miss out a couple of topics just because we haven't quite had enough time. Um, we sort of did the purpose of the church. We didn't really finish the minute purpose of the church last week. So to summarize in three words, what would you say the purpose of the church? Why does the church exist? If you can do it in three words, not center point church, but the church. Evangelism is one, yeah. Discipleship, yeah. That's two words, that's pretty good. Um, evangelism discipleship. Um, the other probably is the, what's that? And so discipleship, theoretically, discipleship could include worship and fellowship and all that sort of stuff. Um, bringing the kingdom of God to every part of the world would be the it's slightly bigger than evangelism, so that's where we feed the homeless and all that sort of stuff. Um, Wherever wherever the world is not in order with God's kingdom, the church is supposed to be the vehicle to fix that, bring God's kingdom back to wherever it's not, um, which is slightly larger than evangelism, but very important as well. Okay, so we will. What is conversion and sanctification? This is. Um, let's get rid. So far. So far, we've talked about. What was God's purpose? God's creation is what God was after. Yeah. His purpose was to create a world, fellowship, harmony with Him. We see His intention there. Sin came and broke everything. Jesus came and restored the kingdom and declared the kingdom had come. And then He uh, established, I guess, as a way into the kingdom. And which we call salvation. So we're going to look at pretty much what is salvation and how does it, how do, what are some of the big words that we look at with regard to salvation and all of that. So this is a quote from your Pentecostal worldview textbook. 
Um, the goal of salvation in Christ is a people for God's name. People enter that community one at a time. Um, and almost every aspect of getting into that community, the people of God, is a work of the Holy Spirit. So God's purpose is not just to save individuals, but to create a people, create, and that's what the church is. We enter that community one at a time. Each person has to have their own moment, the way they get in, and that's all done by work of the Holy Spirit. And these are probably our big words that Christians throw around all the time. So let's have a quick think. What do all these big words mean? When some when we say conversion, what do we mean? Becoming a Christian, yeah. What else do we mean? From one to another. What's car conversion? What? Car conversion. Anyone heard of car conversion? That's like what's that? Can't hear it. That's a crime, right? When you steal the car and you rebadge it so no one knows it's the same car anymore. That's we you like change the color, change the number plate, change some change, change it. Yeah, you, you guys are obviously way too holy. You don't have a, <laughs> right. Oh, I used to say way too holy. Yeah. Way yeah, from maybe a, maybe oh, that was a holy. maybe that was a crime. Maybe that was a crime when I was a red kid, but you guys never have heard of that, right? That was a thing. Car confusion was a you know, you have a workshop where you grab cars, you steal them, you change bits, so they're no longer recognizable that's the same thing. They probably taught something. So can so becoming a Christian. Um, what did you say, Lauren? From one place to another. Can you give an example of classic conversion? Um, classic conversion, if you were Saul's Paul. Okay, that's a classic conversion moment. Yes, because Saul was a Christian persecutor and then he became a Christian church builder. So that's a complete conversion from one to the other, change, complete change of direction, things like that. Okay. Um, other examples of conversion? What would be your own conversion? Did you, who has a conversion story? We all do. As dramatic as Saul to Paul, yes. Let's come back to our own conversion stories, maybe at the end. Um, what's repentance? Turning away from sin, turning back to God. Yes. Um, anything else? Yes, maybe. Sorry, it's sort of being sorry and saying sorry and sort of asking, asking for forgiveness. Um, probably less, less important than the actual turning around. That should be a driving force for it, but changing direction, the New Testament, the New Testament understanding of repentance is change of mind. So new information gives you a new position on what you think and what you believe. And that results in a change of action because so change of direction, change of action based on a new understanding or new insight. What is faith? Believing in what we don't see, yes. When it comes to salvation, salvation conversion, you could we could say conversion is the key elements of conversion is repentance and faith. What do we mean when we say faith in the in the context of conversion? But yes, so if I say to someone, the key elements of becoming a Christian, entering the kingdom of God, are repentance and faith, what, what, what do I mean by faith? What faith and what? Faith about what? Because there's, yes, faith and belief, obviously, but what would be the key elements? What do I have to believe? Faith in Jesus, yes. So, okay, faith, Jesus died for us. What does that mean? This is, uh, yeah. Speak a little bit to read on about Christmas so really clearly. What did someone in the book of Acts chapter 2 when someone was added to the church? What was the new revelation? 
that changed their world and changed their whole life? What did they suddenly believe that they didn't believe the day before? <laughs> these are good. These are good words. But let's think about your average person who was living in Jerusalem on the day before Easter, right? And then the day after, or a week or six weeks after Easter, Jesus was the Messiah. Was the um, the key fact for those people, right? That before then, they probably heard of him. They were probably in the crowd that said crucify him, right? Then. At, Peter gets up and they're all speaking in tongues and he starts preaching and he says, repent and be baptized, right? They were repenting about something and they were putting their faith in something. So the thing they were believing was Jesus was the Messiah. That was their new faith, their new knowledge. And when they figured out Jesus was the Messiah, how did that change their life? And Forgive forgiveness. So what were they repenting from? They were repenting from the law predominantly in Acts chapter 2. They were repenting from crucifying Jesus, I would say, because he pretty much got up and said, you crucified him and even though he's the Messiah. And they're like, oh my goodness, what shall we do? That's a mistake. Uh, and then we'll repent and be baptized and you'll receive forgiveness. And so but their repentance thing was well as first it was turning away from the fact that they crucified the Messiah uh, and accepting him as the Messiah. That was their main element of faith. Um, and therefore went on, they became a new community of people that were Jesus Messiah followers. Most of them didn't really turn away from the law. They were quite okay to keep going to the temple and keeping the Sabbath and keeping sacrifices and stuff. But they, now they had their trust in Jesus the Messiah. Jesus, that was their main thing. Now let's go to um, Cornelius in the book of Acts. What was his fate? So who was Cornelius? He's a Roman soldier. Right, and he sent, he saw an angel, and the angel said, Send for Peter, who's living in the house of Simon, it's Hannah, and he will give you a message that you need to understand. So Peter comes and he starts speaking to him about Jesus, uh, and then they speak in tongues in the middle of the sermon, right? Um, so he had a conversion moment right then. What would be his repentance and faith for the Roman soldier that becomes a believer? Apart from Trinity and Jesus and the <laughs> Holy Spirit and anything else that sounds like a good thing. What's he repenting from and to? What's he putting his faith in? Oh, we might not talk about that. Is it wrong for soldiers to kill people? No, we'll talk about that some other time, right? <laughs> Ethics. Ethics class. Two weeks from now. Two weeks? I think it's. I swear you're doing it back. Are we? Oh, okay. Well, that's bad. Maybe it's six weeks from now. Oh, 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 sorry, Josh. I know it's not next, but this week. Okay. Okay. So Cornelius, the Roman soldier, repents and believes when Peter comes and preaches. He repents from his sin, yes. What would be his particular sins that be the main thing he's repenting from? Remember, he's a God-fearing Roman soldier that has built the synagogue and loves God's people and gives to the poor. Hmm? Heresy, great. What's his heresy? What is his heresy? So heresy is wrong belief. What's, he, what's Cornelius' wrong belief? Just as it generically speaking, as a Roman soldier, what's going to be a strong belief? <laughs> Probably he's an idol worshiper, predominantly, right? He's a Greek, so he's got to worship the emperor and he's got to worship Zeus and whatever the other Greek Roman gods that they had. That was probably so. He probably, although he respected and maybe supported the Hebrew religion, becoming a Christian for him meant turning away from the Roman religion to follow Christ as the as the creator, saviour, deliverer, everything of the world. He wasn't a Jew looking for a Messiah, but he was a person needing to find out who was the behind the universe and who was the one that should worship. So his repentance is probably fully breaking from Roman worship to Jesus worship. That would be his main repentance thing, given that he was a nice, decent sort of fellow. Um, Paul's repentance was obviously 
turning away from persecuting the church and realizing that Jesus was actually the Messiah and actually believing. And he's the one that probably really encountered what, what we explained to us, what we actually believe when we become a Christian. He gives us a lot more detail about what our faith is. So now for a 21st century Australian person, when they repent, what's their fundamental repentance? Think of someone who's really not a Christian. What do they have to, what new information do they have to acknowledge and accept for them to become a Christian? That they need Jesus, yes. That there is a God, yes. Yeah, and it follows if he is, if he, if he really is there and he died to take away our sins, then I need him. Now, so the idea that there's a, I'm a sinner is a, is a new thing, new revelation. Um, those are some of the things. And what's their faith? What they're going to put their trust in? What would be their faith? What's their faith? They're believing what they can't see. What's that going to be in? <clears throat> and Jesus, the story of Jesus from the Bible really is, really is true. You're going to be believing that. You're going to be believing that. Not only believing that you are a sinner, that's something you can't see, right? But then you're believing that God has made a way. You're believing that there's life after death and that's in heaven with God. All of those things are part of the package of when we believe. Of course, when our first conversion moment, we might not have the whole package. Our first conversion moment, and this is what we'll probably talk about next. When you first came to God, what were you repenting from and what were you believing in? This is a question right now. We talked about what well, it's in the Bible. What when you came to God, what were you repenting from and what were you believing in? You were five, yes. You were brought up in church. Yeah. So it was a logical progression of understanding of who God is that you're supposed to follow Jesus and ask Jesus into your heart or whatever. Okay? So did you ever repent? I guess I would. <laughs> okay, and what did you, what were you, Believe, do you remember the time? Do you remember the moment? No, not fully. Not fully. I just know that I was fired from a bad life. Right. Yeah. Who remembers? Yeah. Do you remember? Were you repenting or believing in anything in particular? Yeah. 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 How old were you? Yeah, and you believed. Yeah. Christian upbringing? No. Cool. Okay. Josh, you were like three, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I remember um, just, I guess, being in that age and kind of. Uh huh. Told me when you're soon later. Oh, it is a problem. I'm just stealing someone's toy. That's it. I don't take that. That's right. Um, yeah, so I guess it was more of just a, like a, a repetitive trying to be back to that. Yep. Yep. So the change of mind that you made was actually I do need to follow Jesus, not live my own life. Yeah. Pretty much to change of mind. George, what about you? Yeah. 
repeated salvation moment. sorts of things so your first moment was finding that the bible was the truth yes that was a new revelation yes sir. that and then it changed everything from then onwards the, yeah. the yeah. the, 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 for me probably the new information was i'd been brought up in church and i was probably about 10 i don't really know um and i'd been up church for a long time but i'd never actually heard or understood the actual message of the salvation and gospel I don't know if that's a reflection on the church I was attending or just I, my ears were shut. I don't know. But I was at a beach to, at a sun outreach program at a beach on a holiday. And for the first time, I completely remember, I actually understand what it's all about. I knew all the Bible stories for years and years, but now I actually understand. I don't know it's the first time they ever said it straight up, but you need to get born again. You need to repent. You need to, so I, that was new information. And as a response to that new information, then it was like, okay, I, I understood the formula. You have to stop living for yourself and live for God and do that, you know, and ask Jesus into your life, um, confess your sins and stuff. So that was, would have been my um, thing. It was definitely a, a new information moment that I'd never seen it before. <clears throat> and, then, and then it was a logical thing. Well, that's what you're supposed to do. Um, you have that choice either then to follow or not. So um, repentance and faith found... Well, I would say a foundational to conversion um, because everywhere where you see it, there's, there's some sort of repentance and there's, which is a change of information, change of direction and faith in what you've heard about who Jesus is, as you said, faith. The fundamental things are that Jesus, we are sinners. Well, God exists. We are sinners. Jesus has made a way for us to be reconciled to God. And rather than trusting in what we can do, we're trusting in what he has done. It's a that, and that's the way we become. And I had a, actually, it was interesting. I had a conversation with some people who are, it's a, they're homeschooled. And there's this Christian homeschooling group in Perth that you have to apply to join. And they actually ask you, they have an interview, like you have to answer right out. It's like applying for pastor's credentials. You have to um, answer questions. And one of the questions is, do you, how confident are you that if you were to die, God would let you in heaven? And um, and then and then and next, why if God asked you why you should come into heaven, what would you have to answer? All right, and you can see they're probing to see what your understanding of the gospel is, right? Um, and so and it's interesting. So I asked these kids, we were they just came out. Um, I said, so well, what what should, would you say then? If God says to you when you get to heaven, why should I let you in? What's the answer? And of course they're like, no, okay. And so this is interesting because Christian family. Okay, but been to church all their lives, don't know. So and um, so the answer is, what's the correct answer to that question? If God says to you, why should I let you into heaven? The answer is, because Jesus died on the cross and took away all my guilt and shame. That's right. That's the only answer that would count. And I guess that's what they're looking for. And like the first the kid I asked was like, oh, well, I've been good. That was the, that's the standard answer that you get. I've lived... Okay, and these are, that was interesting because these are Christians. Um, and so they really try to have got, obviously, the kids are only like seven, so that's okay, right? But they haven't really got it yet, but, um, the understanding of what the actual gospel is. So, but that's an interesting question to give a one line answer on that. that if, when you get that right, your faith is in the right thing. Um, that's the idea. Okay, what's regeneration? It's a, a or adoption. <laughs> obviously, they're two different. Two different words that sort of use the renewing. And, and the, in terms of Christian salvation, what do we mean by regeneration? New life. Okay. 
new creation, right? If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old is gone, the new has come. He must be born again, all of those things. What gets, what gets born again? What gets made new when you get saved? When we talk about regeneration, what happens to a person? Spirit, born again, new life, yes? What doesn't get changed? Your body stays the same. Correct. Most of the time, your body stays the same. Your mind and your emotions normally aren't transformed at that salvation moment, right? Your spirit is born again. The rest of you is still old and needs work. Yeah. So adoption, what's adoption? As a, as a jargon word for Christians, what are we talking about when we talk about adoption? Becoming a child of God, being welcomed into God's family, chosen, selected, brought into God's family when we weren't before. Yes, very. What a, justification? <laughs> What's that? Just as if I never sinned. Who said that? <laughs> okay, what does that mean? It means being made righteous. So whenever we, we are justified, we were enemies, we were hostile, we were no longer qualified as righteous in God's sight, and God makes us righteous. Again, not because we did something clever, but because God just declares us as being righteous. That's justification, being made righteous. What is righteousness? What is righteous? So right standing, yes. Approval, yes. Um, look being correct and acceptable to come into God's presence. Being, when God looks at us, there and he sees us in the image of God that he created us in, rather than the corrupted, destroyed sin image that we put on ourselves. So righteousness is being, then again, being presentable. Um, in God, look, look, God sees us acceptable in his image as he created us rather than sinful and far from us and unworthy so this is and right, right that's righteousness that's given to us sanctification what is sanctification what did you say covered sanctification so righteous justification is probably covered made righteous so there's there's two parallels in the, in the old testament they talk about covering in the New Testament, we really focus on cleansing. It's not like that there's a covering over our sin. Our sin is cleansed right out. It's a better, it's a better thing than the Old Testament, right? The, the New Testament thing is clever. But sanctification, set apart, made holy. Um, <clears throat> so remember, something is sanctified. This is a sanctified clicker. It's set apart for the use of God, right? It was sitting in office works, wondering if it would ever have a meaning in life. And all its friends were taken to high schools and businesses and stuff. Okay. And they were like, whatever. This one was sanctified and set apart and brought to the house of God for holy purposes. Right. It was drowned in oil and it wasn't. Right. Okay. But it's a sanctified one. Okay. Set apart for God's purposes rather than its own, rather than everyday purposes. So we are set apart for holy purposes. So sanctification implies, first of all, we're set apart for holy purposes we're no longer just worldly people living in the world doing worldly things we're set apart for something greater something more important and because we are we therefore the follow-on of sanctification is we are set apart and therefore we behave like a set apart person that's the, the, the sanctification involves the setting apart and then the conducting ourselves like we are set apart so therefore the the way a set apart person conducts themselves is different <coughs> to a way of someone who's not set apart because they are just this one this thing here you'll never see them sinning this clicker holy and righteous at all times because he knows he's got a purpose he knows he's got a holy purpose and that's the, the sanctification for the believer you right? so they talk about you know paul talks to timothy you know, a soldier doesn't get involved in civilian affairs. Mm -hmm. Now, what is he meaning? He's meaning because you're set apart for the kingdom of God. You have it. There's some things that other people are doing you haven't got time for because right. you're focused on just on the holy purposes that God has for you. And that's that's what happens to a believer when they get. This is all happening at salvation. The sanctified <laughs> set apart happens, and then the lifelong process 
of now acting on that revelation that I've been set apart for a holy purpose. Um, glorification, what does that mean? Those here. Hmm? When we go to be with God, it's fully realized when, when we are fully transformed into the image of Jesus. That's right. And when we see him, it'll be completed. When we see him face to face, we'll be fully glorified into his image, the, um, the same as he is. That's right. So then these are all at salvation. This all happens at salvation, and it all continues to happen until the final end of salvation when we see Jesus. Those are some of the big terms we it is important that we, it's very easy to read scripture and read these words, we're not actually having a handle on them. So we want to have a handle on some of these. At the foundation of our Christian experience is a transforming encounter with God. We call this conversion. This is from our textbook, or this is from actually from our last textbook before this one. Conversion is a life-changing encounter with the triune God, which inaugurates a radical break with our old fallen existence and a new life of fellowship with God and other believers and with all creation. Okay, we talked about our conversion stories. Here's um, what we do when we come to God. We have an intellectual change. We talked about that. We get new information. We actually have to agree. I can hear that God is real and that sin is real. I can either resist that um, information and, and disagree and not like, or, or I can agree with it and accept it. So when I heard I actually understood the gospel. Then it was on me to actually receive it and obey it rather than fighting against it. So we have an emotional change where we agree. And then we have a choice change, a volitional change, when we decide that we are going to trust in that information. So in 21st century, what is, what's an example of a 21st century Christian putting their trust in something unseen about the kingdom of God? randomly because we talk about faith as faith and evidence that aren't things that are unseen in the old testament or in the new book of acts the classic thing for a jewish person was to say now i'm trusting in something i can't see i'm turning away from sabbath laws and sacrifices and trusting in the resurrection of jesus as my way to please god that was their thing what would be something for us as a 21st century person where we're putting our faith in something invisible and actually changing the way we live and we live different to someone who's not a christian because we trust in something invisible so going to church what's the point of going to church yes so as a believer we see things as an external observer would see you walk into church sing a song listen to a speaker walk out again what's the point of that there's no observable um, benefit Okay, okay, people are friendly and that's nice and eat food, that's cool. Yeah, but what's the point of lifting your hands in worship, speaking in tongues? What is that? Okay, that's weird. Laying hands, all these things we're doing, there's no actual visible, observable thing that they actually benefit you in any way. So we put our trust in tithing, great example of people giving their money, and we believe that there's a spiritual principle that those give and you will receive, that we're better off tithing than if we kept to ourselves okay that's that's faith in something that's invisible we may have testimonies that show that while i've been tithing i've been blessed but there's no logical scientific observable thing these crazy christians are doing something based on something invisible this is this is a faith that we are um that we are putting our trust in and then that's what that's what we do we make we put our trust in the information that we have heard primarily for a new for a 21st century australian we're turning away from independence from god and self-rule and to someone else ruling over us to to jesus the jesus of the bible ruling over us instead of self-rule that's probably the 21st century australian thing we're turning away from a foundational life on money and possessions as the way to meaning and purpose and putting our trust in christ instead and the kingdom of god the things of eternity rather than the things of now those are probably the big changes that people make in in our culture when they put their faith in christ because those are some of the big that wherever our culture is significantly different to the kingdom those are the big changes that people are making and trusting in the things that are invisible and eternal rather than possessions right now trusting in what's inside rather than what's external those are some of the repentance moments um conversion what's the role of the church in conversion 
The church proclaims the gospel. The church welcomes people and helps people to come to Christ through um, conversion rites. Okay, so when someone makes their response to Jesus, the church helps them to and welcomes them into the family of God through through rituals and rites that um, that we do. So, what do we do to welcome people? To help them make a transition from being a stranger to being part of the community of Christ. What are our rituals and stuff that we do? Oh, we can welcome to church young, yes, but that's sort of welcoming Christians or welcoming people into church organization, but it doesn't really, you can go to welcome to church whether you've been born again 100 years or haven't been born again yet. That's not, when someone actually wants to get born again, how do we incorporate them into the, into people of God. We give them a Bible, yes. We do some discipleship things. What else do we do? Alpha course. So we teach we have teaching programs, yes. But you can go to a teaching program whenever you feel like it. Okay. When some what the main things that we do, right? We do the sinner's prayer. Right? This is a ritual that we do that's supposed to be the moment that people come to Christ. Okay, and that's, that's become like a thing that we do all the time. You say this in this prayer, this is your way in. What else do we do when someone becomes a Christian? That's a ritualistic thing. Baptism, fundamental thing, right? We baptize people, and that's the, you're now one of us because you've been baptized. Um, those are, and those are probably the main two things. We don't tattoo people or anything like that. <laughs> hmm? We try and get them connected into the groups, but again, all of the, a lot of those things aren't dependent. They're not a you were well. They're not really welcoming into the spiritual church community. They're welcoming into the center point community. So welcoming people into the church as a new word, and now you are probably baptism is the main one. Um, also call repentance prayer are probably the main. Those are the main things that we do. What did the church used to do infant baptism? Right. What was infant baptism about? Why did they baptize babies? Anyone know why they used to baptize babies and why Pentecostals don't? I don't know. No, that's what we do now. But it was predominantly based on the fact that um, if you didn't, you, baptizing the baby means that if they die before they're, they, they'll still go to heaven, right? Okay, because we, they're back, baptism, the ritual of baptism got you into heaven, regardless of what was happening. And there was a national, everyone in the country was part of the church. The church and the, and the political, the national identity was the same, right? There wasn't, there was like, so being a, uh, a, a member, a citizen of England meant you were a member of the Church of England, Okay, you were all, it was all one package. And so as soon as you were born, it was like your citizenship moment. You are now a member of the Church of England, the citizen of England. Okay, it's the same thing. And you have religious benefits by being baptized, but you're also counted as one of, you're one of us in the country. And so the, um, about the, in the Reformation, it's when they said, hold on, this is all wrong. You can be baptized as a baby and have no faith and no repentance. And that doesn't count before God anymore. Um, and it, and so that was what the moment when sort of infant baptism be lost became lost its favor and lost its thing. One when you suddenly had churches that were the national church rising up and during the Reformation. So we had the Catholic Church was the universal church for all of Europe and what sort of thing. Then you had these reformers coming along, um, Lutheran churches that said, "Well, we believe in faith, not in works, and our salvation through faith in God and repentance and that sort of thing." So they started churches. To actually start a church in a country in Europe, you had to get the government to say it was permitted. And that they, to do that, they had to say that the Catholic Church was no longer the only church allowed in the country. And this was a huge, big political manoeuvre, okay, that changed the whole landscape of democracy, everything. It was a big deal. And the government sort of enjoyed it because that made the Catholic Church not run the country. But it also meant that being baptised as a baby didn't count as being because it didn't matter what church you went to, a whole lot of things didn't count. And baptism, child baptism, was recognised by the reforming churches as not being a guarantee of salvation. It wasn't. You can get baptised as a kid and suddenly you're in. It doesn't matter what happens after that. You're all good. Um, 
So this this is like, this was a new revelation, and because that's how people were, that's how the the religious understanding was at the time. So so we don't do that, but we do because we've seen Jesus praying for babies and having babies is a spiritual moment, and so we do dedicate children that we see, which is closer to what we see in scripture. Um, what else? Does, who who remembers any initiation rites into the church when they became a Christian? You were baptized and that was a big deal, yeah. Yeah. Baby baptism thing, yes. Yes, I had baby baptism thing. So when I went to a youth camp and they talked about baptism of believers after you understood the gospel and you come to Christ and you end your old life through repentance, through death, through baptism, and then you raise a new believer and da da da. I'm like, they made us have we had to get our parents' permission before we could do it. So we had this whole group of kids that are on the phone from the camp, bringing home to their parents, saying they wanted to get baptised. Is it okay with mum and dad? Which is interesting. Oh, oh no mobile phones, that's right. Well, they had a phone. That's right. A lot of people waiting at the office to use the office phone to call their parents to um, ask for permission to get baptised. So that was an interesting thing. But um, yes, so we, we had that revelation. I had that revelation. So it's a little bit controversial to parents, but like, oh, okay, whatever. Okay. Um, so, anyone else? Initiation moments into church? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And then my parents were born. Ah, Bobba. So, all my older siblings did that second. And got another name. So my okay. Right. So you're when you're Chris, when you're baptized as a baby, you get names, and then you get more names when you do your whole communion. Is that how it works? Yeah. Uh, yes. Right. So your name is given a, a, a religious name to link you in with some. Okay. Yeah. Well, it comes. Well, I, you can see the link because when God met people, He changed their name, right? And so they are they're sort of they. It's like institutionalizing in a, in a ritual, something that God does, but we'd rather God did it spontaneously rather than just, this is the thing we do. When you turn 16, we give you a new name and, yeah, so. I imagine so. Yeah. Yeah, okay, so we, after you became a Christian, what connected you into the church? Anything? Prayer of repentance. Prayer of repentance, yeah. And what to say water baptism was just that's again it's the thing that, yeah that's cool so that's the connection in we um pentecostal churches generally minimize rituals and things and major on heart things which is good yeah. but there's some sort of ritual should be accompanied with it because it helps people actually realize that they've done something it helps them understand you can't exactly have the sinners in the say seating section in church but it's almost what you need, right, to help people understand they've made a transition. What does God do in salvation? God convicts us of sin and he calls to us. He opens the word to us and helps us to, to respond. The spirit of God is always working whenever someone is coming to Christ. And this is an interesting thing. Where do you think the Holy Spirit was working in your salvation? Now, when you got saved, when you, made, when you were converted. Where was the Holy Spirit working? I'm pretty sure that was the Holy Spirit that illumined me to understand the message. I'm sure I must have heard it before. I've been to the same kids evangelistic program for like five years in a row. And I've never at all heard the message until either they were useless the first four years or they actually, the Holy Spirit just opened my heart to receive it that time. And I think I'm pretty sure that's probably how it worked. <laughs> so Holy Spirit working and Holy Spirit drawing you back when you were 13, whatever, is that a Holy Spirit, do you think? Was that you? You? For you, how old were you when you came back? I never went to go to church. Right. I was probably about 23 when I saw that you gave me yep. to church in Canada. Um, uh -huh. And do you think the Holy, can you see the Holy Spirit working in some way in that time? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. But, uh, like, even just the fact that I ended up where I was at that church at that time. I've seen a period of time that my parents going to church and my parents wasn't great with having in the church because it's yeah. going. 
had a really hurtful moment and left was not going to church yes. at all. Mum and Dad happened to, in those few weeks that I wasn't going to church, buy a new car. I had a big one, a loan on a credit card, but they had some money on as well. So I took over that payment for their car, mm. which gave me the freedom to then buy my own church. Right. And that was a saving for us. Mm. I wouldn't have gone back to church yep. if I didn't have a car for any yes. amount of time. So, yes. Very yeah, definitely. That was a, a whole lining up that, that the stuff was in there that they had to pay off and had the beating arrow had no cash. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Mm, cool. Anyone else? Holy Spirit active in your conversion moment. What was God doing? Hundred percent. You fell under the power when you were three, right? In the room when you were three. I did not fall under <laughs> the power, but like, that is the like, yeah. I Part of the, our understanding, because it's a work of the Holy Spirit, as you say, it's something that you almost theoretically you had the theoretical option to fight against it if you really wanted to, but it's it's got it's a work of God within you, and it just happens. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So today we've talked about we've talked already talked about regeneration. We've talked about that. We've talked about all of these. So there's some notes and some scriptures on each one of these things. Um, what's is there anything else we need to talk about? Justification. There's a whole lot of stuff about the re the Reformation was a big deal, and if you don't know church history, it's pretty important to understand before um, the salvation, but before the Reformation and after the Reformation, um, the um, basic. Where's that? That should be up here. Blah 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 blah. Before the Reformation, conversion was an initial deposit. They used to say of what they call prevenient grace. God would give you some grace, and then you had to work with God's grace in conjunction with the sacramental system, and hopefully God would accept you with the resurrection. This was the way that the church operated before Luther. Okay, so they said that God, when you came to God, you received a deposit of grace, and then it was up to you to work and participate in the sacramental system. So that's confession and all the different rituals of the Catholic Church. And hopefully if you did that well enough, you'd be accepted at the resurrection. Um, which of, and you can understand why that gave the church total, like almost total control over the population because if you didn't perform well enough, even though you were a follower, you wouldn't get accepted into eternal life. So there was a high like control factor and everything. And then Luther came along and said, hold on a minute, Faith and salvation, righteousness is done, bang, in one day when you put your life to do complete change. Um, and you can imagine how that would sweep through a, a church, through that system, and bring a big change. But that was a big deal for um, the, the understanding of the kingdom of God and the church and everything like that. Um, and that's important for just for us to have a handle on. And that grew out of that into baptism after that um, and all those sorts of things. We haven't talked about predestination, and we're not going to, we're going to run out of time. <laughs> okay, we're just going to go with justification by faith because that's the big deal. Okay, there's um, extremes of errors on it, right? This Gnosticism focuses on intellectual assent to beliefs, just believing the right things, being able to recite the right statements without actually living anything out. Okay, and that's an extreme, and there's a lot of people and modern churches that can understand and say the right things but they haven't actually been transformed by them okay and then on the other end you've got people that do the right things and don't really think it's all about you have to do the right things that's not as much of a big deal in pentecostalism and modern pentecostalism and um 30 years ago 40 years ago when i was a pentecostal kid teenager there was quite a lot of focus on doing the right things 
and some people would have said it was too extreme and there wasn't um, an understanding of grace and if you didn't perform to all of these things then you were no longer accepted really into the church you had to live that exactly the right way so there's a both extremes are a problem but we are going to focus on what we call living faith right appropriate forgiveness by grace that's fundamental and living faith is faith without works is dead living faith receives forgiveness by grace 100 percent and when living faith receives grace the result is sanctified action okay and if you if, if you see if you don't see the sanctified action flowing out of the living faith then the living faith is not living because um dead faith confesses but doesn't live the same faith without works is dead very important for us to understand salvation is all the work of god's grace which we receive by faith sanctification that's amazing well um, we will finish now sanctification is living who we are sanctification is believing and acting sanctification is ongoing salvation and being part of the community sanctification that's where we are living right now we are living in the sanctified place right now where we are set apart we are holy you know i am blessed i am healed i am all those things that we sing come from the promise that god has declared us to be that way already and now we our role is to keep continue on living and believing in that position that god has put us in we'll stop it's 10 o'clock we'll stop the subject we've got another subject to go and that's um stop the video and we'll have a